Hello and good evening. Most welcome to 811. We are really catching on here. Going wide into the 800s, the new century of interesting thoughts. And it seemed to be no stopping on the creativity. New ideas seem to be popping up anywhere and everywhere. And this latest is actually something coming from the Google uh, uh, machine. It helped me somehow. They have their own encoding. They sort of calculate what is needed for each and everyone to sort of lure them into the net. And I'm very thankful for that. And that got me to a fellow called Jeremy Schmaman, and this is neurology uh, once more, just like David Bader, uh, Barbara Tversky in some uh, aspects, uh, Judy Spaccio, Judy Spencer, Lykoff Johnson in some ways. This is the neuroscience of the superfluid thinking. And we are now looking into yet another part of the human brain. We were previously talking about David Bader and the prefrontal lobes. They take care of the executive function. And until recently, we had no idea what that part of the brain was doing. Uh, Oddly enough, people were making the conclusion that it didn't serve much of a purpose, more than being a sort of a reserve in the head if something else were to fail. Uh, it turned out that it was the most important part of the brain. It was actually that one that made thoughts into action. Now we're going to talk about what is before action, the actual thoughts. And also here we had some problems. Our fixed way of looking at the world, sort of uh, saying we know it all and it needs to fit a pre-made scheme. That was the reason we needed an explanation for the prefrontal lobe to accept that they had a purpose. And by not accepting the prefrontal lobe, we made lot of, a lot of conclusions that went into the wrong way. It's the same with the cerebrum. It's a part very mid into the head. The cerebellum is a regulating power for the thoughts. And when I say that we were stuck in a model, I mean that we used to think that thoughts were representing something. In the West, when we're speaking of thoughts, we used to say, I think in pictures, I think in words, something like that, that it represents something. But that is quite unusual in the world. Thinking is seen more like an action and it has quite another range of descriptions. And I think it's our cultural coloring that says that thoughts are words or that thoughts are pictures. That's something we say, but it's only half accurate to the case. Thinking is more of a wave and it's always different in quality. Most Westerners are so stuck in the idea of representation, they can't even feel the difference in this wave. And that's very important because because it is with the difference of the way you do things, so to speak. Plan things that will later go to the prefrontal lobe to be executed. So we need to know our muscles and thinking of them as words or pictures, that is not helpful. Although they could sometimes be helpful to be seeing words and pictures. It's not passively think that way. What you need to think about thinking is understand its wave, its length, its strength. And uh, just to mention some cultures, some have an, a scale that goes up into the very high register and it's graduated in 
like 50 different scale units. That's a good way of thinking of thinking. Something similar to that, you need to know how strong you are in your arms. Can you lift 40 kilos, 50 kilos, 60 kilos, something like that. Although that thinking is much more important that you are specific. It's not enough to only have five different levels. Uh, you need at least 20, I'd say. So, there has been a model going on in the West and it made our thinking very stuck. Let me tell you a little bit about the cerebrum or the cerebellum. The cerebrum is the brainier part, it's in the cortex and it's, that's the thin layer of grey matter that cover the whole of the cerebrum. The cerebellum is tucked beneath the cerebrum and is the seat of the muscle memory. It also coordinates fluid movements. So it's a movement coordinator. Cerebral uh, cerebellar circuits form a bidirectional communication loop between the cerebrum and the cerebellum. And we think today that robust cerebrocerebellar connectivity may coordinate fluid cognition, much like it coordinates fluid motion. So the motion I have in my arms and hands and legs and so forth, I move my body, is coordinated by the cerebe cere cerebellum. And the cerebellum is at the very same time making the thoughts in different gradations fluid moving and whereas bodily movement can be very different it's sometimes sometimes not very fluid it's more fluid sometimes depending on how balanced and apt you are the thinking has a much greater register of fluidity and there it's much more important that you actually are in an influence the whole thing uh, which is not the case in the west at all we just leave it as it is actually we don't know anything about the thinking at all and therefore we don't have any chance of influence it we just see them at representation of something to do and by rearranging thinking we can make conclusions and we can come to an answer. That is absolutely wrong according to neurology. And it's also so defective, it can influence your action in the most negative way. And that is called ataxia of the mind. Ataxia means discoordination of movement. And it doesn't matter where there is what we usually call the body or the thinking itself. The thinking could be seen like an incredibly complicated body that there is 50, 60, 70 movements that needs to be coordinated in the exact order and that makes for gazillions of combinations. But also the body is quite complicated and that part of the system we do have some influence in. It could be just a suggestion for my part that this division I talked about earlier but mean mind and body that division is fake it doesn't have a position it cannot be placed anywhere where it makes some sense it's an arbitrary setting and this setting is completely different from every other person. It's not something that we share in commune. When we check people, they have always different divisions from person to person, but also moment to moment. But there are divisions to be made. And one of those divisions we've been talking about are the ones in the body. It's a very important division to make between what is ventral and what is dorsal. They have two complete different directions in human movement. 
principles or an animal movement. The same goes for thinking. By dividing this, we seem to start thinking that the mind is one undivided thing. Just because of the division, it cannot be divided anymore. Or this fake division becomes more prominent and sort of covers, camouflage all other divisions. Here we need in the mind to make conscious, deliberate motions and divisions for it to work. Because the movement of the mind needs to be done in a specific order to be successful. This is very oddly incredibly similar to how the body needs to start with the back. Otherwise the movement will be affected and be lesser in quality. I can give you a clue that right this moment, if you think, if you have a conception that your thinking could be correct or not correct, that you can make erroneous thinking that takes one or zero, it's either correct or not correct, then you are really lost it. It is a gradation here because there are so many different movements in thinking so it can only be a gradation and there is no correct it's a diff variant degree of successfulness which can only be measured in comparison to a reality only with the reality it's too complicated to check itself out so you can say your thinking is correct and i think that really kills off the idea of making insular as isolated logical conclusions by myself i can make sit here and make conclusions imagine i think in words and i put my wordings my verses in different lines and i make at the very end a sort of a conclusion and then i say to myself that's correct that is breaking so many rules not only in urology it's also in there Sort, start like nudging uh, the door of private language. And once again, we have a similar thing as we have with the prefrontal lobes. Until very recently, the human cerebellum was viewed primarily as the brain's region that sole job was to coordinate motor movements. But today most neuroscientists didn't think that the cerebellum facilita facilitated non-motor cognitive functions. But that changed quite a bit ago, in 1998, at the dawn of the 21st century, the motor function only view all of the cerebellum started to shift. And today, most neuroscientists agree that the so-called little brain plays a big role in cognition. Yes, we are talking about what we say in Swedish, Liliana. <laughs> So we have a sort of function that is almost similar to 
what we call primary control and it's oddly situated just me speculating here it's oddly situated almost in the same spot as the conscious control primary control it's just a little above We have an article here from a fellow called McAfee, just like the computer program. And he mentioned uh, that in the 1970s, uh, when he was a rookie tennis player, Arthur Ashe and Björn Borg was his role models. I'm happy to see that as a Swede. Borg uh, was notorious for his cool, almost icy Swedish temperament and grace under pressure. Well, me as a Swede, I never saw him as icy, but everything is relative. <laughs> Ash was a trailblazer who famously said, there's a thing in sports called paralysis by analysis. My, he writes, my surgeon father who wrote The Fabric of Mind filtered the playing styles through bright science. Uh, when coaching me to play like Borg, his dad focused on hacking the vagus nerve by taking a deep diaphragmatic inhalation followed by a long slow exhale before every serve. <sighs> This is a breathing technique that activates the parasympathetic nervous system and it's quelling the fight or flight stress. Actually it did. Oh, it's a recommendation here. Uh, this is a way of hacking the vagus nerve. When coaching me to play like Ash, Dad focused on not overthinking by unclapping my cerebral cortex and relying on cerebellar muscle memory. In the mid 19 in the mid 2000 I wrote The Athlete's Way and my father was the book's medical advisor. From a neuroscience perspective our goal was to give readers a new split brain model that would help them optimize flow states, experience superfluidity, and achieve peak performance. Because the cerebellum has long known to play a central role in coordinating muscle movements, we hypothesized that athletes could improve the fluidity of the motor coordination by emphasizing the importance of bottom-up bottom processing. On the flip side, too much top-down cerebral processing would disrupt flow and was likely to cause an overthinking athlete to choke due to paralysis by analysis. Notably, the cerebrum big brain has two cerebral hemispheres, we talked about them earlier, and the cerebellum little brain has two cerebellar hemispheres. When the coordinating fluid movements, the right cerebellar and the left cerebral hemispheres work together to coordinate motor skills on the right side of the body and vice versa. This crisscross functional connectivity of up brain, down brain is key to creating superfluidity in sports. Interesting, left brain thinking also benefits from robust connectivity to the right cerebellar hemisphere. And whole brain thinking benefits, benefits from all four brain hemispheres working in synchrony. For example, right-handed people who tend to have most of their language function seated in the left cerebral hemisphere. Microzones in the right cerebellar hemisphere coordinate language tasks. During language tasks involving the left cerebral hemisphere, regions in the right cerebellar hemisphere 
are activated as part of a cerebrocerebellar loop. So we have some terms that needs to be clarified. Cerebellum. And the cerebro. This is the big brain, this is the little brain. They are both divided in right and left hemispheres. And when the different hemispheres coordinate in different ways, we get superfluidity. Um, it's very interesting. And the cerebro was until recently uh, the only interesting thing, well, almost only, together with the cortex. But the cerebellum was thought to be sort of mean and not very important because it's only organized the bodily movements. Whereas we know it now coordinates thinking, which is immensely more important. I was just thinking of Stephen Hawking, how elegantly he coordinated his thinking. And although the case he was not able the last 30 years of his life to coordinate his bodily movement because of his ALS. There is also a more abstract point to the whole thing. And that is, this finally also discovers that there is a similarity between ataxia bodily ataxia and a cerebral, cerebral or thought-wise ataxia. And for my own reason, this is most interesting because I myself have been a sufferer of ataxia since uh, my mid-teenage, uh, I was 17 or 18, something other than since I had an accident. It usually affected me and gave me ataxia. There was rather acute discoordination of my whole bodily system. And at the same time, I lost coordination of thinking. I was not able to coordinate my thinking at all any longer. And I remember how odd it was. This is a specific case. I learned something that takes some time to learn, and that's the difference between voltage and amperage. Uh, we call that current and amplitude. And that's a rather complicated uh, relationship when you think about electricity, current. And it usually described with an Gestalt, where you use a flowing river that goes into a fall and the height of the fall is a voltage, whereas the width of the current is the amperage. This is measured in volts. We have 220 in the current, 220, 230 in the current electrical system in Sweden. In the US they have 110. The other one is measured in amperes. Uh, this gestalt helps only to a bit. You need to understand it in another way. And I had the understanding, I remember I had the understanding but much later after the accident, I was asked to explain it. And I remember I could do it before, but I could not any longer. And the first thing I noted, I could not put the words together correctly for this rather complicated thing. And they need really to come into the correct positions for to make a verbal explanation to layman. That's what happened in my case. It was a technician who asked me, he was doing pizza ovens in a place called Lohmanns Holkwerk, and I remember it to this day. It was a sunny May day, something like that. And he's been installing these things for a long time. 
and he asked for a more abstract uh, explanation of the relationship. What is, what are those things? Uh, no explanation that worked came out of my mouth and I was really surprised. And the second more devastating thing I realized, I could no longer reach my own understanding. Also that was lost to me. So I had the knowledge that I used to have the knowledge. It was, I'm quite certain it's still down there. I know now what it is, but it was always down there, never lost. But the actual skill of the cerebellum to take it out in correct order in the exact movement that was lost. And that is called ataxia. Well, it's in this special case, it's just a happenstance. But if it is global on your whole use, on your whole uh, thinking mode, it's called ataxia and this discoordinating of thoughts. And uh, I remember I went through a lot of treatments, there were gazillions, it was a lot of them. It was so much therapy, it was so much rehabilitation, physiotherapy, different solution, uh, the lots, the works. And I remember every time I met upon a new specialist, a new doctor, a new MD, whatever it was, I always asked him, uh, what is causing this ataxia in my body? And uh, that was always ignored at least 20 times as much as I remember, could have been more. Uh, for that they had no explanation and I thought that odd because the two things, the thinking ataxia and the movement ataxia appeared instantaneously at the same very moment and I know that somewhere and I never got an explanation for it, it was completely ignored and nothing to help me with my thinking ataxia worked either. And uh, I think the last checkup I did was in 2004 to check for the ataxia in movement. Somebody came up with a brilliant solution. I had had a stroke of quite a significant uh, amplitude. And I went to an MRI for the fourth, for the fifth time. I don't know how many times I tried that. And there was no evidence of any stroke whatsoever. So still in 2004, nobody know what was going on about these things. And this is something, this ataxia is most often shared by people who are suffering burnout syndrome and similar things. I never ever got any understanding either from therapists and it felt a little bit, I tried to explain, I can't reach my own thinking. I know it's somewhere, but I cannot in a manner that makes sense send it, uh, send the signals to somewhere that was probably the prefrontal lobes. They could not be sent in the right order so as to a proper verbal explanation could come of what I was thinking. So it was a two-way problem. I couldn't send the right instructions for the action, neither could I actually reach the thinking, the perceptions. And thank God I read now that is extremely common. That's the first time I hear that somebody else also suffered this. But I was more or less tortured during the years, at least 20 years, by different people who constantly asked me, what is on your mind? Let's check into your mind, see the representational content of your mind. I couldn't reach it, neither could I express it. And that was going on for on and on and on. And uh, every time I explained I can't do it, that was completely ignored. And mostly I have the feeling I was talking to machines, completely soulless people who couldn't see the bodily ataxia at that time. It was completely obvious, not something uh, arbitrarily connected to me. 
it was so obviously connected to the special case and the ataxia of the thinking that was possible for me to explain and in the situation so these machines i don't give much credit to they cause a lot of harm and they actually imply a lot of guilt because what they do in the end when they don't succeed in doing anything they don't even know what they're doing is they put a lot of guilt you need to start thinking in another way it's a very common expression i uh, much later heard from a lot of people you should think differently something of that sort and uh, it's a little bit like going to a surgeon and say oh, hey i broke my leg and the surgeon was ju just replies i tried to walk a little bit more on the other leg or something like that uh, it won't work if you broke your leg you can't start walking on your other leg you need both legs to walk and this felt like this talking to a surgeon that was stark starving mad had no idea what they were up to or what it was to be a human being, anything like that. And uh, I think there are computer programs, there are apps you can download to your mobile that would do a greater job. And I don't know what harm they are caused to other people. I heard a lot. Uh, for me, it meant complete rejections of what I have. No working solution at all despite hundreds of sessions. I don't know my heart's work. And it was much later I realized on an intuitive basis there must be a connection. I won't listen to those people anymore. Let's start training uh, my motor skills. And I slowly started with very simple tools, repeating, repeating and repeating. And once I saw it was improving slowly, I repeated even more and more and in the end I had skills enough to begin with uh, the most advanced painting method, Renaissance painting and I continued for 12 years and I think somewhere in that way I realized I could also start to train my thinking movement uh, by repetition which is very similar to what I did with my body actually. You see there is a connection here in the cerebellum. It completely takes care of the movement to make it fluid, coordinated in contrast to ataxia. But it also is the one that develops thinking movement. Doesn't seem to be much difference in the end. So of course this is very interesting and it answers a lot of questions that sort of caught up in my head uh, during the decades and I was also in the great fortune of having contact to loads of people who has been burned out and similar maybe a couple of hundreds and uh, they all stated to the same thing nobody understood them they couldn't form their thoughts their movements were really weird at cases uh, uh, some of them didn't want to move anymore because of the ataxia. It looked too awkward, too gawky, too discoordinated, too crowded somehow. It was a sense of everything was happening at the same time. And of course, this also reflects in the vocaler abilities. The voices were usually squeaky echoing, uh, not bringing a lot of sentiment and such stuff. All those things that is quality wise, that this is not going into zero and one here, but a quality wise. So one could say that we are moving from quantity to see thoughts as zero and one and instead see them not as thoughts, not as imagery, but a wave, but with a, with a wave, with a quality, and that quality need to be graded. And to develop the cerebellum, you would need to start grading your thinking capacity, your wave. And uh, this is, of course, the same as prana we mentioned before, because this is a real force. It actually makes us move literally and makes everything else move. 
because this is the thing that also uh, fuels perception. Hmm, isn't that interesting? So let us conclude. This was the very first take on Jerry Schmormann's Neuroscience of Superfluid Thinking. He wrote a book also, and with any luck I will be able to catch that one before I leave. It's called Dysmetria of Thought, not a book one could lose of the oddity of the title. Uh, very interesting. Uh, thank you very much and have a very pleasant evening. Goodbye for now. Bye bye.